ICCSCP 2021. ICCSCP is an international conference organized by the Faculty of Pharmacy Universitas Andalas with the theme Strengthening the Role of Health Science and Technology in the COVID-19 Pandemic Era. It is very nice to see all of you once again, and we hope you have been enjoying yourself at the conference so far. We are very honored to have with us here this afternoon, Mr. Brahma Stanugraha, PhD, from Associate Principal Scientist in Vitro Imaging Specialist at Cardiovascular Renal Metabolism Department, AstraZeneca, Sweden, and Dr. Ronald Rainer Abel from Department of Chemistry, University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Excellencies, distinguished guests, and dear all participants, let's continue our conference to the next agenda, which is the second session of plenary lecture by Mr. Brahmastanugraha, PhD, from Associate Principal Scientist in Vitro Imaging Specialist at Cardiovascular renal metabolism department astrazeneca from sweden and dr Ernat rainer abel department of chemistry university of Aberdeen, scotland this second plenary lecture session will be led by apotheker najimiato fitria phd as moderator now let's start this session by introducing our amazing moderator In 2015 until 2020, she took doctoral degree or PhD of pharma pharmacotherapy, pharmacoepidemiology, and pharmacoeconomics at University of Groningen. And in 2009 until 2011, she took master degree of clinical pharmacy at Universitas Andalas. And here are some her oral presentation experience that so was so awesome. And here are some her research. Okay, before we welcome Apotheker Najimiato Fitria PhD to lead this session, we want to remind you again that you can ask a question by writing the question on, on the chat room and the answer will be given during the Q&A session. Okay, without any further ado, now please help me to welcome our moderator, Apotheker Najimiato Fitria PhD to be on the screen and the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, MC Hafizatul. Um, and welcome to our afternoon sessions. Good afternoon uh, for all participants, honorable lecturer, and all of us. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, today, at this afternoon, uh, I will moderate the second plenary lecture session of the International Conference on Contemporary Science and Clinical Pharmacy, ICC-SCP 2021 in Padang. Dear our honorable speaker and all of the participants, thank you all for finding time and visiting today's plenary lecture on ICC-SCP 2021. As the MC said earlier, I will moderate this second session, which will be given by two keynote speakers who, of, co of course, are very experts in their respective fields. And interestingly, both of our keynote speakers in this plenary session come from European Union. This plenary session consists of two parts. First session lecture from Dr. Brahmasta Nugraha. Welcome, Dr. Brahmasta. This first session uh, that held by Dr. Brahmasta, Dr. Brahmasta uh, from AstraZeneca, Sweden, and then followed by Q question and answers. And then the second session is lecture from Dr. Rainer Abel from University of Aberdeen, and also followed by Q uh, question and answers. And for the first change, I would like to introduce Dr. Brahmasta. Dr. Brahmasta Nugraha is Associate Professor, a Principal Scientist in Vitro Imaging, Imaging Specialist at Cardiovascular Renal Metabolism Department at AstraZeneca, Sweden. 
He got his PhD in bioengineering from Graduate School of Integrative Science and Engineering, NGS National University of Singapore in 2012. And then Dr. Bar Bramasta also got postdoctoral fellow from Roche at ETH Zurich, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich, Switzerland, and continue as senior postdoctoral at the same university until January 2021. And then he also got visiting fellow in this biophysics group, Wise Institute for Bio Biologically Inspired Engineering, School of Engineering and Applied Science, Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. And his area of expertise are in organoids, 3D cell culture, tissue engineering, biomaterial, stem cell biology, bioimaging, microscopy, image analysis with machine learning, and disease modeling infectious disease. Dr. Bramasta already published many articles in his area of expertise as seen in the screen. And then at this station, Dr. Bramasta will talk about seeing perspective from three dimension. How does cell culture give impact in the drug discovery? For the participant, you could also type your question during presentation in the chat box. And for Dr. Brahmasta Nugraha, time and place is yours. Thank you, moderator, and also the conference organizer. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So it's really a pleasure to have uh, a session today to, to deliver what are actually my research about. And I'm going to start screen sharing. Can you see the slide? Yes. Yeah. Yes, doctor. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So for today, I am um, not gonna talk really in deep because I have actually given this talk before, probably in the previous occasions with I four, and the, the idea is to actually introduce about three D cell culture that we actually have been doing for. Maybe I've been doing 3D cell culture since 2007, so it's been like 14 years of research. And then now at AstraZeneca, I am actually working on uh, in vitro imaging uh, facilities to support drug discovery using uh, various complex 3D cell model. And I am actually from Gothenburg site in West Sweden. Um, and maybe I will give you a little bit of introduction about um, AstraZeneca site itself, just as a brief background. So we are actually a global company. We have uh, three different kind of major sites uh, in Cambridge in the UK and also um, in Gothenburg in Sweden and also in, in Gaithersburg in the US uh, that we actually work together, especially in the cardiovascular and renal and metabolism. And I am located in Gothenburg. Maybe many of you don't know about this city. It's, a, it's not a big city. It's about maybe 600,000 um people populations and this is actually um kind of sandwiched in between three major cities like oslo stockholm and copenhagen and then uh for today i am actually gonna talk about actually what is 3d cell culture and also feel free to write if you have any questions in the recording chat. recording in progress if let's say i am speaking too fast i am just to i'm happy to deliver and also i'm happy to have like a by communication if you have any questions so maybe I'm going to talk about the 3D cell culture itself versus 2D cell culture um, as the um, kind of introduction about my talk. And then there are also some of examples that I have been uh, doing in the past uh, 10 years, uh, especially when I did my PhD in the liver uh, lab in the National University of Singapore. And then also a little bit of my work at Roche and also at ETH Zurich in Switzerland about kidney fibrosis model. And then this is actually my last work at the University of Zurich. And then also a little bit of the hint what I am actually doing as a scientist as AstraZeneca, um, which is related to the imaging uh, kind of facilities. And maybe I'm not sure if you have um, been doing a lot of cell culture. I assume so, because this is a very kind of um, um, maybe like um, common methods in the cell culture uh, or cell biology or even in the pharma pharmacy kind of um, department in which we actually culture cells, different kinds kind of cells on the 2D. Uh, most of the cases, we actually culture the cells in the kind of tissue culture flask or well plate base. 
And when you actually see in this very kind of classical paper in 2007, we, when we actually sit the cells in 2D, they actually just look at one dimension of, or let's say something that is a very kind of uniform in terms of stiffness and also the cells where they, where, where they actually originated from what kind of tissue might not like it because they need something more complex. For example, when we look at epithelial cells or mesenchymal cells, they will behave the same. But when we culture them in the 3D, especially when we look at different cell type, for example, in this epithelial cells model, for example, in this case, it's MDCK cells, which is a, a dog uh, proximal tubular cells they form actually this kind of balls with a certain kind of characteristic of lumen structure in which actually there is a polarity of cells that are being developed or, or established when they actually in culture. And look at, looking at the example of mesenchymal cells, when the cells are cultured in, for example, in hydrogel, they're actually free to migrate. And some of the cells that are, for example, benign or malignant cancer cells, they behave totally different when they actually culture in the 3D. So looking at that, uh, we now actually have already developed a lot um, in the research kind of a world. There are different kinds of organs that are actually already built into a complex model. And of course, the application are also very diverse for drug testing, disease modeling, for example, or even infectious disease, pathogen studies, clinical therapy, and also in one of the aspects actually is to produce insulin or uh, recombinant insulin, for example, or even venom from uh, organoids of snake uh, gland, for example, because this kind of uh, 3D cell culture is not only limited to human cell biology, but also to, to animals that are very important to study disease model, for example, that are transmitted to human. So, Looking at the pharmaceutical perspective, because I work for pharmaceutical industry, um, we had a lot of kind of challenges when we develop drugs, for example, in the early clinical drug development in which when we have a lot of drug candidates, they basically do not have a lot of kind of efficacy in the later stage of trials because of efficacy and also because of safety and probably in um, when we look at one of the paper in 2016, only around 13% of the drugs are actually demonstrating ultimate clinical uh, success. The reason is because whether um, the drugs actually have a side effect from the beginning or because the cells that are used as a model might be is also too simplified at the beginning, which might be also true for the both cases. So when we look at the kind of um, the organ kind of architecture of cells inside the organ, there's a lot of complexity in which the cells actually interact with other cell type and also with the ECM and also with other factors like stiffness or even gradients of oxygen and nutrients or even other soluble factors. And this creates a lot of gaps between the 2D cell culture model and also the human that, or even the animal models that we are actually testing. That could be the reason why a lot of drugs are actually showing only um, like cytotoxicity or even toxicity in general in the later stage rather than the earlier stage. And the point of having this 3D cell culture is we try to de-risk these kind of drugs at the beginning. That's why we actually could uh, save a lot of costs towards the early, later development of the drug discovery. And one of the important of 3D cell culture itself in the European context is actually the 3R concept because when we do a lot of animal testing, we always try to uphold this principle to replace animals if it's possible or reduce if we have to use the animals or even refine, let's say, refine means that we actually try to do a, a study that actually makes more um, kind of um, less wastage or uh, less risk to the animals, especially when we use a large number of animal studies. And 3D cell culture hopefully can also bridge this kind of concept because now in the European context, 3D cell culture has been also used to develop artificial uh, meat, for example, beef or even other kind of meats. And of course, the rise of organoids now, we have appreciated that in most of the big pharmaceutical industry, we already tried to adopt all these kind of organoids or complex 3D cell culture model to do uh, disease modeling and also screening of drugs at the early stage of drug discovery or even drug safety testing. Um, 
And there are different kinds of platform, of course, to develop 3D cell culture in the lab, but then it depends on what kind of stage of the drug discovery and also what kind of models we are actually looking at and how actually we characterize them. Maybe one example that I'm gonna touch today is the liver because liver is a very important organ in our body and liver itself has a very kind of complex structures that the cells uh, that are mainly hepatocyte uh, cells in the liver lobes are actually um, detoxifying uh, all those uh, toxin or that they metabolize drugs because they contain cytochrome P450 enzyme or even phase two enzyme in which the cells, um, when we culture them, because normally they are primary cells, they are very dependent on how we actually culture the cells, whether they like it or not, then it's just a matter of whether they will die or they will actually survive because they are normally primary cell um, that we extracted from, uh, from donor, for example, from liver um, kind of donors or even from animal model that are used in the labs. So when I work in, in Singapore in 2010, basically we tried to develop a model that actually tried to help the liver cell or we call it hepatocyte to actually more stable in during the culture for a long period of time. And also they tried to have a more kind of compact 3D cell culture or we call it spheroid in comparison to the collagen monolayer in which the cells are basically just sitting on something flat and might be also they ju just don't have a, a very kind of compact cell cell interactions. And of course, when we compare these models, we actually analyze uh, dynamically how fast they actually form this kind of um, kind of spheroid model and how compact they are. And then we also compare them with the, um, with the red liver uh, as a native organ and we characterize what kind of components or markers that these hepatocytes spheroid have. And also in terms of the functionality, we tested uh, with the fluorescent diacetate to induce or to, to observe that the cells are able to actually excrete the, the, um, the bile kind of light functions. It's like when they actually metabolize uh, toxin. And in comparison to the uh, models like the normal um, kind of standard model that was uh, used in Johnson's and Johnson's um, lab, our collaborators, indeed that the uh, hepatocyte spirit model in the sponge or in the scaffold, um, they actually have better CYP1A2 inducibility in comparison to the collagen sandwich, which actually the CYP1A2 is one of the most important cytochrome P450 in the, in the right hepatocyte. And when we move on to the later stage of our studies, we also use this kind of scaffold to study hepatocyte model for um, hepatitis C virus uh, in vitro studies uh, infection model, because hepatitis C virus actually is a very specific uh, liver disease in which the virus has only specificity to infect human hepatocyte, but then in the lab, human hepatocyte, especially primary cell, they're very expensive. They're not easy to be cultured. So when we collaborated with Roche uh, in the virology department in the US during that time, we actually tried to develop a different kind of models in which we would like to have the infection happens to these uh, primary human hepatocyte uh, models in which we actually pick using the spirit model using the same uh, collagen, um, uh, sorry, the galactosylated uh, cellular six sponge in which when we compare this human hepatocyte as a 3D in comparison to the cell line that are normally used in the lab during that time, which is HU87.5 cells, this is like a cell line. We observe that they are actually maintained in terms of um, a lot of important enzyme. And also the, the um, even up to like uh, 14 days, they are still pretty well maintained in comparison to the fresh uh, culture of the hepatocyte that are not cultured, that is like um, just freshly uh, uh, told from the stock or even in comparison with the cell line uh, model. So then we move on to the study. If we have already the models, can we actually infect this hepatocyte, um, human hepatocyte spirit with the um, kind of uh, a model that has uh, kind of the ability to infect the cells. But of course, before we do infections, we have to characterize these entry uh, HCV markers in which the cells should have so that they are actually infectable before we perform the infections. And then when we perform the infections, we use a pseudo particles, which is like an, an, an envelope of, of uh, HCV virus, which they have just the, the structure of infections. And then we also characterize with the, um, the clone JFH1, which is the, the virus that can actually replicate 
its RNA inside the hepatocytes parade. Um, both cells actually in, in the spirits model can be uh, infected with pseudoparticles, but interestingly for human hepatocyte spirit uh, model primary cells, we have uh, a lot of kind of um, observation that they might have a different kind of innate immune response in which the RNA um, um, kind of replications in this uh, infect infection might be uh, um, kind of compromised. So uh, the when I finish this kind of project with HCV infection model, I actually moved to Switzerland to Roche uh, headquarter uh, that I was actually working as a postdoc in which we actually work a lot with human uh, fibrosis model, especially in the kidney fibrosis. Because when we look at the kidney, actually kidney has a uh, important part, which is the nephron part in which the nephron has the first contact point of, let's say when we take something that might be damaging the kidney structures because they have nephrotoxicity, for example, the, 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 there is a part that actually damage because they have um, like the primary contact. And the idea of this project is we, we would like to kind of model um, the kind of consensus of fibrosis in which fibrosis actually happens because <laughs> there is um, changing from trans transient fibroblasts into quiescent fibroblasts in which then this, this fibroblast, my fibroblast actually depositing a lot of um, collagen, for example, or, or ECM deposition in which they actually damage or making like a scar um, tissues. So we try to simulate this in vitro by having the injured tubular epithelial cells and try to have like a pro-fibrogenic environment to actually induce uh, transition from quiescent proboblast into myofibroblast and in the end is a matrix deposition as a hallmark of a fibrosis uh, process. So during these studies, I, I envisioned to have a, a bilayer co-culture model because I found that when we perform bilayer cell culture models, the cells can be uh, modified separately. So we can actually pre-injure pre the cells before adding the, the, the co-culture, which is the transient um, fibroblast. So we also make sure that the cells at the bottom layer, which is the proximal tubular cells have a healthy cis culture, they have the lumen structures, and in the end, we can actually have like a two different kind of bilayer uh, system in which we can um, induce the injury separately. So the bottom layer is like a proximal tubular cells. Uh, this is uh, actually using a HKC8 model, which we, we use a lot for proximal tubular cell studies. And they have actually formed this kind of tubular network in which they actually have a ball, but with the hollow structures. And the top layer is the quiescent probabilist um, as the um, kind of um, the top layer in which it contains MMP uh, sensitive peptide because the fibroblast has to migrate inside this top layer of the gel. So we use um, this kind of um, advanced microscope, which is a multi-photon microscope, or we call it two-photon microscope in which we actually can image a thicker samples. That's why we actually able to image this bilayer co-culture model. It takes about 12 days for these uh, cells to form this kind of ball. And after the, the 12 days, then we characterize the cells if they have all the uh, important kidney markers like uh, all polarized or transporter markers. And then with the electron microscope, we make sure that they have this kind of microphylized structures, hollow structures and they are able to actually distinguish between two different kinds of molecular weights based on the size. We use uh, live imaging with a uh, dextran uh, fluorescent label, and then uh, we then move on to the characterization of whether when we have this healthy kind of HKC8 cis, whether they can actually be able to be monitored with, um, with the live imaging. So we actually pre-tag the um, HKC8 uh, with a different kind of uh, uh, fluorescent reporters because uh, my interest is also to do more live imaging to monitor if let's say they can actually report a certain, certain kind of uh, fibrotic uh, hallmarks during the studies. For example, in this case is uh, ecadrine, which is the cell cell addition marker and cell cycle track, which can report the dynamic of the cell cycle um, during the injury, for example, because a lot of fibrotic um, environment actually showing that there is a cell cycle arrest in the G2M phase in which the cells are not able to move out or escape from this kind of um, cell cycle arrest. So when we actually confirm that um, 
the cells can actually be tagged with, with endogenous fluorescent reporter. We then use uh, two different kinds of drugs, aristolochic acid and cyclosporin A. They do have a different kind of cell uh, response. For example, aristolochic acid is probably more much, much stronger in, um, in uh, changing the cell cell adhesion. However, uh, cyclosporin A, it seems that at a lower dosage, they are much more um, um, kind of powerful or um, giving a lot much stronger effect to the cell cycle uh, changing. And we also uh, kind of um, monitor the gene expression using AmpliSec uh, panels in which the cells are able to show that they are already in the kind of injured kind of uh, situation before we put the second cell, which is the uh, quiescent proboblast as the, um, the cell co-culture model. And then we would like to see if let's say we have a kind of a sick cells at the bottom layer and the healthy cells as a comparison. And then we put the second bilayer cells or co-culture cells, which is this, the um, quiescent fibroblast. Can they actually change into um, my fibroblast just by having this model as a bilayer? And indeed they show a certain kind of change of the transition into my fibroblast, but then very interestingly, we can actually um, kind of um, prevent or reduce the changing or maybe stop the, the process by adding the prevenidin, which is a known drug for idiopathic pulmonary fibroblasts. And the, the study was then published uh, in 2017. And I moved, uh, before I moved to Zurich, I this was done in Basel at Ross headquarters. I actually had also a continuation project in Barcelona with our collaborators at the, uh, uh, at the clinical um, hospital in which from this proximal tubular kidney model, they have some interest to actually do a genomic editing by having um, kind of um, understanding if let's say we do a knockout of Adam 17, which is known to be like, um, in, uh, to play a, a very important lower role in the chronic kidney disease as a pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic roles. And whether when we actually um, kind of made a knockout of this model with genomic editing, we can actually correlate with our clinical findings from the animal model. Because we, we, we have seen that um, when we actually knock out uh, ADAM17 in the epithelial and also in the tubular compartment of uh, the, the mouse model, we show that uh, they actually protect um, um, this um, from undergoing uh, fibrosis by having a different kind of, um, kind of analysis like um, it is shown here. And we would like to see if, let's say, we have already shown this in animal, can it also be shown in the in the 3D cell culture models by having a knockout model, um, and then we actually culture this in the kind of high glucose environment to simulate diabetes. And indeed, when we knock out the cells, the same cells that I used in 2017, HKC8, and then we culture that as a 3D cell culture model, and we culture with high glucose. Um, we actually show that they are actually protective towards a uh, diabetic microenvironment that the cells could not go into a um, kind of um, in the in a fibrotic kind of related to diabetes um, process, which is very interesting because hopefully in the future we can put a, a wider range in case that we have more specific questions, let's say, a lot of biomarkers that are actually are specific to sex uh, based, whether they are actually male or female. Hopefully, we will continue the studies uh, with respect to our collaboration with um, with my collaborators in Spain. And this is actually the last kind of part of my talk in which I actually perform the studies with the, with uh, clinicians in the University of Zurich and also in the University Hospital in Zurich, in which my professor, Professor Emmert, he's a, a cardiac surgeon. He has a lot of interest actually to do a lot of cell transplantation using uh, 3D cell culture models in which when we actually have heart attack, we actually have a damaged part of our heart, especially in the left ventricular uh, regions. And the idea was actually, can we actually improve the cell transplantation by injecting the 3D cell construct instead of single cell suspension? Because from his studies, actually we show that um, when we injected 3D cell culture model, the ejection force actually was, was much more reduced. That's, that's why we actually have more cells retained in the damaged regions. But of course, I, my, my, my idea during that time in 2016 was actually to develop more in the in the in vitro disease models in which I, I discuss a lot in these two papers in which we try to analyze 3D cardiac microtissues 
as a disease model uh, by having, for example, um, uh, IPS derived uh, cardiomyocyte as a component of uh, 3D spheroid or 3D um, micro tissues in which we were inspired by Professor Yamanaka, for example, in which now we can develop a lot of IPS derived from different kinds of patients and of, of course, different kind of, um, kind of disease, kind of uh, pathological situation in which um, we actually develop this into 3D cardiac micro tissues in which the spheroid are not only consisting of one cell type, but also two different other cell type, which are the non-myocyte, which are endothelial cells and cardiac fibroblasts. So by just um, um, differentiating uh, IPS into cardiomyocyte, we showed that in, 2000, in 2020, in our latest uh, publication, we already showed that the um, by having this uh, very simple uh, three components differentiation uh, from this hypertrophic cardiac myopathy, uh, IPS that we actually derive into cardiomyocyte, they already have a very abnormal kind of um, um, jaggered um, contractility in which we were actually interested um, to develop further with our uh, further analysis after confirming that actually they are more towards cardiomyocyte. And looking at just the staining from, this is the healthy cardiomyocyte, this is the disease cardiomyocyte, which is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in which they have a mutations in one of the genes, the MIH7 genes uh, that causes uh, this array of these sarcomeric structures. Just 15 days after differentiation, they already have this kind of um, disconnected arrays of these sarcomeres that are still, I would say, this is still uh, immature cells. And then when we actually, uh, mixed with two other cell type as a non-myocyte component, we then show that uh, in comparison to the controls, uh, this is a golden standard of cardiomyocyte, and this is the healthy, and this is cardiomyopathic mic uh, micro tissues. We show that they are actually very loose structures, and some of the cases, they are actually much more uh, enlarged in comparison to the healthy um, micro tissues or even to the control, which is the, um, the uh, golden standard. So by having this uh, calcium imaging, actually we, act we also monitor the changes of the, um, the calcium ion during um, this, uh, through, throughout this ion channel from the sar sarcomeric um, um, kind of compartment to the, to the cytosol. So we use a, a dye from um, molecular devices in which um, when we monitor using white field um, microscope, actually the, the of course the, uh, the healthy um, golden gold standard of this cardiomyocyte, they have uh, much more regular structures. And the healthy also, also of course, they are still um, immature because of the, the, the process that actually we have to prolong for the maturation of the cardiomyocyte. However, in the disease kind of compartment, we, we see a very kind of weird structures. And that is an indication that this cardiomyocyte uh, that is formed into cardiac micro tissue could show a disease kind of model in vitro that are very useful when we would like to screen drugs or study disease uh, in vitro. And as a continuation of this uh, process, maybe when you look at the uh, previous um, studies um, that I performed in the lab uh, in the previous slide, maybe I will go back to this slide. You, when you look at this day 15, this is actually just culture on the 2D cell because this is a differentiation protocol that are very kind of commonly used in different labs. We have a lot of problem because the cells are very contractile. They like to move because they have already the calcium um, activities in the cells and we lost a lot of cells. So the way that we actually try to address this process is by having the differentiation directly in the 3D cell culture itself by using the robots that we actually have already in the lab, um, where I actually use this kind of round bottom uh, kind of uh, well plate, 384 well plate base. And we perform this um, differentiation directly in the well plate. So this is so much more uh, high throughput process. We actually can culture the cells, change medium, and then induce differentiation for the between 15 to 16 days of culture. And we then prevent the, the cells from delaminated from the, the bottom of the cell culture uh, plates. And the very interesting part is we do not need any more protein coating as what we have done in the 2D cell culture, like for example, in Matrigel case, so we just directly culture the cells. And it's very interesting that the yield is so much more um, um, kind of uh, in a bigger yield compared to the 2D cell culture, of course. And when we move to the characterization, we also, um, Sorry. 
we also uh, found that uh, there's so much more um, kind of uh, long-term studies that we actually can move toward the maturation of the um, cardiomyocyte. I, because of the time, I'm not going to discuss so much in detail, but if any of you are interested to ask more questions, feel, feel free. And maybe the very last um, topic, uh, one of the um, possible topics that are probably related to more uh, developing countries that are actually still doing this research with the University of uh, Zurich um, colleagues um, uh, that I have uh, Swiss national grants uh, that are still ongoing. We actually use 3D cell culture model to develop intestinal organoids because intestine is a very kind of complex kind of model uh, to be um, developed in, in, in vitro. And one of the models that we actually we try to address is by having a model of uh, a cat um, kind of intestine in, 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 in the lab because cat intestine, it's especially a small intestine of a cat. Uh, when we compare to the mouse, they are very different, uh, of course, in terms of the um, arrangement of the uh, cell, uh, multi-population cells in, in, in this kind of organoids. And very interestingly that only in feline or in specific it's cat, they actually can support Toxoplasma gondii infection cycle because they can uh, support the sexual uh, development of this Toxoplasma gondii in this um, small intestine of the cat by and by having this uh, in the lab, we hopefully can uh, have this sexual development and we, we hopefully can understand how this Toxoplasma gondii actually can infect human because they're very specific only in this uh, small in, um, intestine of the cat. And of course, it's so much more tricky to have cat studies as an animal models in, in FIFO. That's why by having this uh, small uh, intestine of cat in vitro, hopefully we can understand in a larger uh, kind of context, high throughput, but in a smaller scale, and hopefully also to have much more uh, kind of robust understanding of the infections. So the project is still ongoing. So I'm looking forward to have more uh, results that we actually have in Zurich in Switzerland. And by having this kind of polarity, kind of um, changing of this uh, small intestine, uh, we actually have the ability to form this kind of a huge small intestine of cat in vitro. And by having this uh, kind of polarity reversal, we actually can have the presentation of this domain for the infections with the Toxoplasma gondii because they are very different, of course, by having this in, in, in FIFO model, because in vitro, we still have to expose this microvilli outside, so we call it apical out organoids, to actually induce the infection. And then the sexual stage will um, happen in this um, small intestine in vitro cat um, model. So of course, um, maybe before I finish the slide, there's a lot of consideration when we design 3D cell culture model, depends on what kind of purpose and depends on what kind of characterization you would like to do. Because for me, maybe I will characterize more in the imaging perspective. Of course, in the imaging, we have to also understand what kind of um, thickness and what kind of um, color of the cell culture. But of course, this is also open to other kind of um, areas for um, assays, whether they are only a spirit or whether they are actually organoids or maybe it's a organ on a chip or even bioprinting. And also, of course, all of, of these platforms have advantages and disadvantages. We have to be careful when picking up the, the uh, or when we try to address a questions, for example, in my current research focus as AstraZeneca, actually I'm in charge of the um, imaging facilities um, for uh, cardiovascular, renal and metabolism areas of uh, disease area. So my, uh, my uh, responsibility is to support high content and high throughput confocal imaging using this Yokogawa high content screening that we have in, in, in AstraZeneca uh, in, in Sweden. We actually try to understand a lot of cellular response with respect to the early uh, stage of the drug development. And we try to actually de-risk all these kind of compounds before moving to, to the later stage. And then I actually have um, the capability to analyze all those complex um, cell culture with respect to the image analysis of, of what are needed and what are uh, required for the, uh, the drug discovery uh, process. So I would like to also mention that there are a lot of, uh, even though we are a pharmaceutical industry, but we are actually very academic based. We do a lot of cool research um, between these three major sites in the world. We have a lot of uh, research opportunities. Please feel free to look at the possibilities of many kind of programs, let's say even master program, internship program, PhD program, also 
And then the last, maybe a postdoc program. We have a lot of postdoc projects ongoing. And I'll be happy if you would like to ask questions. I, I, I actually gave my email address in my uh, slides. Feel free to ask uh, or email me if you have any questions about the research that actually we are doing in AstraZeneca. And maybe this is the very last slide. Uh, I am also still in charge of the two different kind of MD MDPI journals. One is the polymer in the polymer materials in biomedical applications, special issues. And the second one is the new MDPI, it's MDPI bioengineering. I am in charge of the 3D cell culture model and system imaging. If you need any uh, recommendation for publication, publication chart discount, especially when the paper is accepted, feel free to email me. I'm happy to give discount because uh, MDPI is known to be quite expensive uh, in the publication chart, but I think it's fair if you have, um, uh, if you especially come from developing countries, but you have good quality of research, I'm happy to give the discount. So, um, so in conclusion, uh, from the past 14 years, I'm been, I've been in the 3D cell culture, there is a lot of revolu revolution, especially uh, in, in, the, in the field. Now we already adopted 3D cell culture in a lot of um, industrial research areas. In addition to advanced imaging or um, cell culture analysis uh, using image analysis and machine learning, we believe in the next 10 years, we will use a lot of this complex model to build or to discover new drugs. And then we hopefully reduce also the animal uh, testing or even one of the possibilities to reduce animal testing for cosmetic and just use the skin 3D uh, model, for example, this has been, I think, de well developed or well appreciated in one of the countries like in Mexico, for example. So I would like to thank all my collaborators from Singapore, from uh, Switzerland, and also from uh, Barcelona. And I would like to thank you for your all your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brahmasta. Um, before we go to the question, I would like uh, uh, I would like to ask for apologies for the typo in your in your CV. <laughs> Uh, on behalf of the committee also. It's really uh, now some uh, presentations and I hope uh, here uh, in the chat box, we already have a questions from uh, Mr. Stefanus Lucas. It's, yes. it's about uh, vaccine. <laughs> because, because now we are in a pandemic area in AstraZeneca uh, produce a vaccine also and the, the question is about how long efficacy antibody after the second vaccine AstraZeneca stabilized? I have to say that I'm not allowed um, for AstraZeneca employees. We have the ah. code of ethics. We are not allowed to discuss vaccine. Uh, especially to the external parties um, because we respect the rules and then I can re always did redirect the questions to the uh, the external kind of manager because they we always have a centralized kind of contact person so that we try to avoid everybody has opinion because in the end it's not good when everybody speak and it might be also different from everybody. So we always say that we are not allowed to speak about vaccine at all. Yeah, yes, because you are in the field of cardiovascular diabetes metabolism. Okay, <laughs> it's clear enough. And this is also, uh, yes, from Professor Fatma Sriwahyuni. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much to excellent presentation. Although 2D cell culture is more widely used for routine cell culture, 3D cell culture methods are starting to widely use in vitro. Can you share with us what is the challenging when uh, we use 3D, 3D cell culture? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the challenge is the size because sometimes uh, when we use 3D cell culture, it depends on what methods, of course, maybe when we have more resources, we can always control the size. And also it depends on the cell model. If let's say you are using a cell line that, uh, that are very fast in replications, they will grow really fast. For example, when we culture tumor or cancer cell, 
they grow really fast and really big. So the challenge is uh, until what size we actually could monitor the cells because then when the cells are in the 3D cell culture, they are too big. We have of, of course the difficulty in monitoring the cell kind of healthy or maybe the core of the cells are already dying. And then it becomes also a challenge when we do imaging, especially when we use a live imaging microscopy like confocal, then the size is too big and sometimes it's beyond the diffusion barrier. Like if it's be, be beyond 250 micron, then I would not be able to look at the whole kind of cell inside this uh, spirit. Of course, then it, this is the size and then the, the limitation maybe or the challenge is that um, most of the kind of uh, reagents for 3D cell culture, I think they're still also expensive. It's definitely compared to 10 years ago, we have more options. We have a lot of more competition people or vendors selling cheaper, for example, maybe in the, in the back, 10 to 10 years ago when the material is dominate, dominated by uh, Corning's, we only have one source of material. This is very expensive source. Even for uh, European lab, it's still very expensive. And then um, now they have a lot of um, kind of commercially available material comparable or even synthetic. So it's so much more cheaper. But of course you have to be careful because we have to also analyze whether it's the same quality. Also, this is then becoming a challenge whether the 3D cell reagents are affordable. So, and then probably also the technique because 3D cell culture technique might be also a little bit more challenging to the 2D cell culture because when we use 2D cell culture, then the cells will just plate and we, we, we put the cell, then they will just uh, be plated on the cell surface. But in the 3D, sometimes we have to do uh, different techniques and Sometimes the medium changing also a little bit more different when we change medium from the 3D, maybe we shouldn't damage or touch the, the spheroids. So it's a lot of consideration and it becomes also a challenge. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, 3D is challenging, 3D, uh, 3D, uh, 3D cell is challenging, but the chance for accepted in publication in article is also higher, higher right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I, when, uh, for example, when you address more complex model, definitely, for example, when you try to do a co-culture or tri-culture with 2D, definitely is really difficult because they are just 2D, but in the 3D, then you can address so much more complex cell configuration. Then of course, for the publication, it becomes more valuable. Uh, depends of course on the, the questions and the hypothesis, but it becomes more uh, possible. Oh. Yeah. Uh, okay. We still have times. Uh, uh, I, uh, I would like to ask some questions actually based on my background. I'm a uh, my background is in clinical pharmacy. So about this uh, cell culture, you told you about the hepatocyte and also the hepatitis uh, virus, C hepatitis C virus, HCV, HCV. Um, and how could you get the human hepatocytes here in yeah. your research? And do you have any collaboration in CRC or your institution have clinical research center? So it will be easier. So when yeah. I performed this human hepatocyte uh, in 2009, 2010 in Singapore, actually we, it's, it's I, I, I acknowledge that it's a very expensive cells. Uh, we couldn't get this from hospital because then we, we, we would be dependent on the donor. Sometimes they are available, sometimes not. And also we have to be careful when we uh, get this uh, from donor because we don't know if they are uh, alcoholic or if they are smokers or if they uh, consume medication. So during that time, the project was funded by Roche. So uh, our collaborator at Roche actually already secured a lot of a frozen uh, human hepatocyte from in vitro gen. Um, that, is a, that was a very expensive cells, but the idea was to have a lot that are a bulk amount. So if let's say we have maybe at least two, 20 different files, we have a big batch that we can compare uh, in a large amount because when we only have one lot, uh, a small or one file, then maybe when we would like to run the second cell, sometimes in most of the cases, the lot has been pre-booked by some other researcher. So it's, always a good idea to have a big lot reserve 
Uh, I'm not sure if it's for now the same, um, but what I know, a lot of researchers are already differentiating hepatocyte from uh, stem cell, from IPS, for example. I think uh, from 2009 until now, I believe there's a lot much more um, resources if you would like to get uh, differentiated, um, hepatocyte differentiated from uh, IPS or from stem cell, I think it's so much more um, kind of possible to have these cells now in comparison if you would like to have kind of cryopreserved human hepatocyte like back in 2009. And also for HCV, hepatitis C virus. Okay, for the HCP, yeah. um, at the beginning of the study, when we would like to analyze the uptake of the virus, so we only use the envelope of the virus, that's why we call it uh, HCV pseudoparticle. So it's just an envelope of the virus that when we have the infection, then we lyse the cell and then they have the luciferase activity inside. So the, this pseudoparticle has kind of uh, a signal for um, luciferase uh, kind of uh, analysis. And that was for the uptake or the, um, the viral entry. And when we perform uh, the RNA of the virus, so this is live virus, you use a JFH1 uh, kind of um, genotype of this uh, HCV virus. We only perform this in the US because uh, when we would like to bring this to Singapore, it's very dif difficult because we didn't have the biosafety level three kind of facilities. So one of my colleagues performed the experiment in the US. It's only possible there. Yes, as you know, because uh, transfer, uh, transferring a live, uh, live segment particle, we need material transfer agreement and biosafety level. And also uh, in the chat box, also a question about the advantage, the differences, uh, the, advantage, the advantages of 3D cell culture compared to 2D cell culture. Maybe you will wrap up this question, even though you already uh, yeah. explained. Um, maybe the advantages, uh, the very simple to start is when we culture cells in the 2D, uh, we actually over generalize the cell type. So when we put maybe cancer cells and then we put uh, bone cells, heart cell, kidney, or liver cell, we put on the 2D on. Uh, tissue culture flask or well 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 uh, well plate base or petri dish we just put them on it not all of them will like it because bone cells might like something much stiffer they like something hard substrate but liver cells they like something soft and also brain cells they like something even softer so when we have the 2d we actually offer generalized the cell substrate and this is not true because when we use different kind of cell model we have to adapt with the mechanical stiffness of the cells uh, requirement. If let's say the cells like something soft, then we have to put them in the hydrogel base that has the same mechanical stiffness with the cell so that maybe it's uh, maybe about 10 kilopascal for liver, then we have to adjust this stiffness based on the hydrogel concentration that the cells would like to sit or to be cultured on that. That is maybe from the mechanical substrate uh, stiffness perspective. But of, also the advantage is that when we look at liver cells or hepatocyte on the 2D, um, especially when we culture primary cells, they will not be surviving after seven days because in the 2D, they don't have any, because they, they will sit on something flat. They don't have any contact in the upper surface of the cell. So they don't have something to grab. Just and imagine when someone was sitting on something uh, flat, they don't have a neighbors on top of their upper surface, then they will not be happy, they will be stretched. And after seven days, they will basically de differentiate and then eventually they will be dead. But when they are in 3D, you can imagine that we are also like, uh, we are human, we are also the same like self, we like neighbors. So in the 3D, we are in contact with not only with uh, in the X and in the Y position, but also in the Z position. So we are always in contact with each other. We are always um, be very close to each other. And sometimes our neighbor is, is not the same as us. Sometimes they are different. Sometimes they are from different cell type. So when in the 3D cell culture, they really like this kind of um, networks that are so much more dense. In the end, they are much more uh, functional. So in this case, that they are much happier. 
so that uh, the response of a study, for example, when we do a certain kind of drug studies, they are so much more physiological compar in comparison to the 2D. And uh, the third one maybe uh, is related, related to the second one. When we use 3D, then it's much more possible to have more than one cell type because we can combine different cell type. And sometimes we also can combine with a different kind of matrix. If let's say they need collagen, if they need matrigel or laminin in 3D, they're always possible. And then maybe some of the studies like in the cardiomyocyte, the cells like to be exercised. They are like, they, they like to perform sport. So they like to be stretched and you cannot do this in 2D, but in 3D because in 3D they have the support for all this stretch. Okay, thank you. And one more question, Dr. Brahmasta. This is about publication discount. Uh, <laughs> I have to refer back, but I I can refer back uh, in in it's it's because for the special uh, issue editor, I can nominate uh, the publication discount. I am not sure about the number, the nominal, but I have the ability to give discount, ah, especially okay. uh, when the paper is accepted. Okay. Uh, what kind of journal? It's only uh, it's, or... it's MDPI. So only in, uh, yes. MDPI. Uh, I have two uh, MDPI in charge. The first one is MDPI Polymer. I think it's the impact factor is around four, if I'm not wrong. Wow. <laughs> so wow. the I, I am so I am the editor for Polymeric in Biomedical. And let me refer to this slide. It's like a. So in MDPI Polymer, we have different kind of uh, special issues. So in the special issue I'm handling is polymer materials in biomedical application. So uh, when you submit, then I will actually receive the, the, the articles. Then I will decide whether uh, it will go for uh, editorial review or reject. So if I know that this is a good quality, then I will go for suggestion into the editorial review. And when the ed editorial if you already said, yeah, it's good paper is accepted, then I have to decide again, then I can give the discount when it's accepted. Yes. And yes. it's the same for the MDPI bioengineering. If this is uh, a new for MDPI bioengineering, it's just like less than one year old, but also from MDPI. It's MDPI is the publisher, the, but MDPI uh, bioengineering is the journal. So this is still uh, waiting for the impact factor, but I think it's going to be quite nice because uh, this, the standard is... We always set, set a good standard for quality publication. Thank you for information because we all know that for a high impact journal, yes, the article processing fee is really high, yeah, even yes. for European European countries. For Indonesia, it's around. Uh, if we have to pay two thousand until three thousand US dollar, is around tiga puluh until empat puluh juta yeah. for publication. Yeah. It's really expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's why I asked for that questions because uh, all researchers want to be uh, want the uh, her work to be published later. Yeah. Uh, I think we still have three minutes. Mm -hmm. Is there is any questions? One question from Nova in Q and A room. Uh, maybe direct. Yeah. Uh, so I cannot see the question from uh Miss oh, Miss Nova. Yes. Yeah, no, I cannot see it. The question is, uh, let me uh, yeah. uh, try to, yeah, uh, reading the question. Thank you for the inspiring talk. I was wondering, based on your expertise, is it possible doing biological activity screening of plant extract with 3D cell? And what uh, advantage and disadvantage doing 3D cell screening of single compound and complex uh, sample like plant extract? Okay. Uh... So the question is whether uh, using 3D cell culture is um, good screening for extra. screening extra. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, yes. I mean, I, I mean, here I have been doing a lot of screening using 3D cell. Uh, depends also on the on, on the model. Uh, it's already done for uh, liver. Depends also on the analysis whether you want to to study only cytotoxicity or 
you would like to study uh, maybe metabolism response or maybe the proliferation kind of differences. It depends on the model, but it's possible. We have done uh, screening using hepatocyte steroid or even cardi uh, cardiac steroid or even some of the, uh, the other colleagues using uh, cancer steroid to study screening of uh, cancer drugs. So, but I'm not sure for the plants because we haven't done it here, but I think it should be possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bramasta. I think uh, it looks like that we've covered all questions. Uh, for those who still want further explanation or any kind of question, you can send an email to the committee because, mm -hmm. uh, and then the email address is in our website, iccscp at far.unan.ac.id. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to cover before wrap up, Dr. Bramasta? No, thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. Uh, then we will give a certificate for appreciation, uh, appreciation for your lecture and time. I will give we, uh, I will give it back to uh, MC. Okay, thank you, Doctor, for guiding the plenary lecture three very well. And I would like to thank Dr. Brahma Stanugraha for sharing his knowledge that very useful for all of us. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Brahma Stanugraha again to be on the screen to take the certificate as the appreciation and thanks for your willingness became the plenary lecture three speaker in ICC SCP 2021. And please give your best smile because our ID committee will take a screenshot for documentation. Okay, I will come. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Okay, for the next agenda is the plenary lecture um, four that will be delivered by Dr. Bernard Raynor Abel from Department of Chemistry University of Aberdeen, Scotland, and will be guided by Apotheker Najimato Fitria PhD again to our amazing moderator. The screen is yours. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Miss MC. Uh, okay, next. We will go to the second session of this plenary lecture. We will be given by Dr. Renat Reiner Abel. He is a senior lecturer at Aberdeen University, Scotland. He obtained his PhD from University of Wurzburg, Germany, majoring in pharmaceutical biology. He did postdoctoral post research fellow in the lab of Professor Phil Cruz. University of California at Santa Cruz, USA in 1998 until 1999. Dr. Rainer Abel uh, also has incre incredible publication in Scopus. He has 42 index Scopus. He already has many outstanding publication and even in, 20, in 2021, his publications are still ongoing. Some on, some on his public, uh, latest publication can be seen on the screen. And Dr. Rainer Abel has several research interests, including biologic, biologically active natural products, stru structure elucidation of biologically active marine and terrestrial derived natural products, characterization of natural products with um, and also microbiology, especially cultivation of marine fungi or analysis of secondary metabolic profiles. On this occasion, Dr. Reiner will talk about natural products from Egypt to Chile, a tale of lassos, clusters, and textiles. Uh, Dr. Reiner Abel, time and place is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Fitria, can you hear me? Yes, of course, clear Good. enough, yes. And yes. let me start the slideshow. Can you see my slides? Yes. Wonderful, Neither. that's working great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd like to, first of all, thank the organizer of this very, very interesting conference for giving me the opportunity 
uh, to present uh, our latest findings here. And yeah, thank you very much for this very, very kind introduction. <clears throat> um, today, I will first of all talk about a recent project that just finished that we had with Egypt, where we were looking into endophytic fungi as a source of new antibiotics. I will then switch to the um, class of bacteria and talk about our analysis, chemical characterization of extremophilic actinobacteria. And in the last part of my talk, I will talk about microbial co-cultivation. So the first project uh, was a bilateral project run between Scotland and uh, Egypt. On the Egyptian part, I will show the participants in a moment's time. On Scotland, I'm very happy that one of my former PhD students, Mustafa Ratep, who's now an established scientist by himself, was also part of this consortium. He is situated at the University of the West of Scotland. So the main participants can be seen here. The um, Egyptian research lead was uh, Dr. Ahmed Shalabi. And you can see myself, Dr. Shalabi is the uh, male person on my right. So if you look at the screen on the left of me, and I would also like to use this transparency to say a little bit about the background of the project. So obviously I'm a chemist, but we were also interested in uh, incorporating biologically active extracts into textiles. And that picture was taken when we visited a Egyptian textile um, company. And you can see basically what they're doing. So we have started to incorporate our extract into textiles. The idea is if you use that in a hospital environment, you may need less of chemical um, detergents or um, antibiotics. So these studies are ongoing. Um, so I can't really say too much about the ultimate results, but certainly I can talk about the chemistry. And I also would like to introduce Dr. Silvia Soldatu, a lady standing in front of me. She was a postdoc hired for this project and besides developing quite amazing skill, skills in handling textiles, she also did all the chemistry in this project. And most notably, she was the one who established in my research group access to a software tool, a freeware tool called GNPS, the Global Nature Products Social Molecular Networking. And that is something I'd like to talk about in a bit more detail, simply because you will see in my slides that we're using this actually quite heavily. So GNPS was uh, created by um, American researchers. Um, and it is a free verb tool. So as long as you have MS data, you can access this from Indonesia the same way as we ac access it from um, Scotland. So the driving force behind that is P Peter Dorostein, an established um, researcher from um, California. And it allows you to analyze large MS data sets. I should be a bit more specific, MS, MS data sets. So you need fragmentation information. And that works with both high resolution, but also low resolution MS data. The main purpose of this is to help you in dereplication, meaning to identify known compounds as early as possible in the isolation process. The idea is you don't spend a lot of time and resources in identifying a compound and purifying it uh, that you then find out is actually a known one. So it allows you to pinpoint in a quite specific manner. And again, I will have examples of this in a few moments. Um, if your extract actually has a chance of containing new compounds. And it actually um, automatically analyzes fragmentation patterns in the mass spectrum. It calculates similarities and on, on that basis, it is able in an unsupervised fashion to group different components into in your extract automatically into clusters of chemically related compounds. The idea is if two compounds are chemically similar, they will have similar 
fragmentation patterns, either identical fragments or identical mass losses or a combination of both. And it calculates the similarity between two mass spectra, including their fragmentation, based on what we call the cosine score. Identical fragmentation patterns would lead to a cosine score of one. And anything above a certain threshold, 0.6 or 0.7, is then considered being part of the same family. It also allows you to do a database-based search. It has a relatively limited um, but growing um, library of user-submitted um, sample MS spectra. And again, I will show you in a moment's time uh, how this actually helps to identify known compounds in a more or less automated fashion. And more importantly, I will also show you how this then allows us to prioritize samples for further analysis. Obviously, we are at the moment not working with plants, but if you're interested in Indonesian medicinal plants, it would work pretty much the same way. So our um, sample flow or our analysis flow at the Marine Biodiscovery Center, MBC in Aberdeen, is in a nutshell, summarized in this transparency. We normally go into the field, collect make microorganisms. So we are very much like marine organisms. So we like sponges, corals, and so on, but we do work occasionally also with plants. Um, in many cases, we use these microorganisms. We, we analyze them chemically by themselves, but more importantly, we use them as sources for microbial diversity. So that means we use established microbiology methods to isolate fungi or bacteria. And then we normally end up with relatively large numbers of cultures. We normally only grow them at a small scale first and then analyze them chemically. And that's what this double arrow is supposed to indicate. We also subject them to biological activity testing this testing depends on the project we're looking at. We have very simple antimicrobial bioassays in-house, but in most cases, we actually work in collaboration with others. So we may, for example, also analyze anti-Alzheimer or say anti-cancer properties. If the results of the biological testing and the result of the initial chemical analysis, again, I will show you in a moment what that really means, is positive, promising, then we will select the same culture for large scale, and then we go back to the lab, grow it at a larger scale. We work with fungi, very popular in our group is to use rice-based media, that's what this picture shows. And already at this stage, we analyze the MS data that we get in the first in, um, analytical run through the GNPS tool. Um, and if we decide we want to isolate promising compounds, we also use mass spectrometry for to help with structural um, characterization. Again, examples will follow. We separate the compounds using column chromatography, including preparative HPLC. At the end of the day, we end up with a pure compound. We then subject it to analysis by NMR spectroscopy. So this was the principle. Let me start with some real examples from that uh, project with Egypt. So we went to the Red Sea, or I should say our Egyptian partners went to the Red Sea and um, collected sample of mangrove plants. And these are very much the same plants that you have in Indonesia. I happened to be in Indonesia about 10 years ago. So I went to Povacato. You pretty much have the same mangrove plants that you have uh, in Indonesia that we find in the Red Sea. So in that case, case they, our colleagues use the seagrass Telassia hemprichii and they isolated an aspergillus strain M113 from it. And very quickly, we could detect the presence of a cyclic peptide, a known compound called emerosalamide. Um, mass spectrum will follow in the next transparency. There's an interesting connection to the last part of my talk. This compound was originally described by the research team of Bill Fennigal, an eminent scientist in our field. And interestingly enough, this compound was actually obtained upon co-cultivating a marine-derived fungus, Emerycella, that's where the name comes from, 
with his famous um, actinomycete, marine actinomycete, uh, Salinospora arenicola. And in our study, we could get the compound without any co-cultivation, but at the end of my talk, I will also introduce our efforts at using co-cultivation of microorganisms to increase the metabolic diversity. So let's get gets back to this project here. So technically it's a mixed polyketide non-ribosomal pack pack. So you have this fatty acid like part on the left of the structure and the rest is a uh, classic peptide. So the cycle is ma mainly made up of classic amino acids. Also the biosynthesis is known. And again, later I will also show you how we use genetic information about biogenetic gene clusters to inform our chemical research. And what was relevant to us in the context of that project is that it has been described as having moderate antimicrobial activity against Staphylococcus aureus. So in our group, that sample was worked on by Kevin Miranda, a very talented PhD student now finished uh, from the Philippines. Um, oops, for some reason it's going the wrong way, sorry. That way. So here you can see now the output of the GNPS. Don't worry if you can't see anything, I will have an enlargement of the relevant bits in a moment's time. The typical picture that you get when you analyze your MS data through GNPS are a series of clusters and the idea of these clusters is each cluster has individual nodes, and each node is, in principle, a chemical entity, entity by itself, meaning a given nature product. So the task is always to try and find your compounds in this enormous amount of clusters that the GNPS produces. And I have um, highlighted with this kind of greenish background the relevant clusters for the imracillamides. Just one more thing in, in this transparency before I show the enlargement. Uh, in many cases, the um, GNPS picture is dominated by so-called self loops, the one that you can see at the bottom. These are compounds that can't be grouped into families by the software because they have either no fragmentation or unique MS fragmentation patterns. So it really helps if you have a regular mass spectrum of your extract as well, then you know actually what to look for. So the imracillamide clusters taken from the previous transparency that now enlarged a little bit are shown here. In red is the mass that corresponds to the known imracillamide A. And we use electrospray. So in electrospray, you obtain what we call quasi-molecular ions. And interestingly, the software can't tell that the M plus sodium and the M plus H that we both observe are actually one of the same compounds. So you really need to look at the MS data rather carefully. It's not like we have 10 different compounds here, but in reality, it's five different ones, which always are present as the two different types of quasi-molecular ions. So in red, you can see the molecular weight or molecular formula corresponding to emerosalamide A. Um, if you see that cluster, you know that the other compound in that same cluster should be chemically related. And sure enough, that allowed us to relatively quickly identify emerosalamides C and D. The problem is um, the um, GNPS software can't really deal with isomers. Isomers basically are one of the same compound. That's why we can't say whether it's C or D. But more importantly, if we look at the other nodes in the cluster, we can detect molecular weights which are not represented in the databases of known compounds. That means there's a very high chance of them being new compounds. And this is then a prompt for us to go back at the extract and try and chemically isolate the compounds with the molecular weights that are not known. And you then have a very, very high chance of getting new compounds. Uh, just to say one more time, so each node, each of these um, rectangular shapes is a unique mass and they're connected through these uh, thinner and thicker lines. The thicker the line, the higher the cosine score, that means the more closely chemically related uh, they will be. So the initial picture we got when we looked at our extract, you can see here, is 
that we only have one major peak, but quite a bit of um, mess late in the um, run. And that peak corresponds to emerosilamide A. So we could have identified this compound and we did in fact identify this compound without the use of the GNPS. But again, what the GNPS then did and what was really helpful, it told us right away that we not only have this one compound, but we actually have four or five members of that family of compounds, including probably three new members of the um, family. Uh, just one word of caution, MS is really depending on the degree of ionization of a given compound, which is not really a tangible property. That's something you can't really predict. So you have to be very, very careful when you look at the mass spectrum. Um, to judge the amounts. UV is a different story. In the UV spectrum, you, if you assume you have the same chromophore, which should be the case when you're dealing with related compounds, then you can much better judge the quantities. From a mass spectrum, that's not really possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we also use MS to establish the fragmentation patterns. And for a peptide such as this, this is extremely helpful because it actually allows us to sequence the individual amino acids. The analysis of cyclic peptides actually is not really trivial. So you need some sophisticated approach to it because the ring can open at pretty much any position. That means when you're dealing with cyclic peptides, you normally have quite a few parallel sets of fragmentations going on at the same time. Um, in the interest of time, let me skip that one. Uh, let me show you one more example of such a GNPS cluster of a different strain. Uh, that is a fungus that we, uh, at that point, had only identified uh, based on um, a lab code 3S. Uh, and here we could immediately detect the presence of butyrolactones. You can see the enlargement of that blue cluster. And once again, this cluster did contain new compounds besides known compounds. And the reason I'm showing this here, if you look at the two blue arrows, I'm not sure whether I can point with my mouse, whether you will see that. If you look at where the blue arrow starts, you can see the shape of the node is different. It's kind of triangular shape. That indicates a database hit, that means the GNPS database could tell us right away that two compounds, butyrolactone one and two, are present in our extract with high likelihood simply because other researchers previously had submitted the mass spectra and fragmentation data for these two compounds. Um, here you see one example, a third uh, strain, where we actually took it through. So GNPS. Uh, allowed us to identify itaconic acid derivatives. And once again, we found known ones, but also new ones. And here we actually had enough material that we could follow through. And indeed, we were able to then specifically isolate the peaks corresponding to unknown masses, which led to the discovery of so far undescribed itaconic acid derivatives. And again, that was only possible because the GNPS kind of pinpointed this to us, that we not only had the major compounds, which all were, were known ones, but trace compounds, which luckily were present in large enough amounts upon large scale fermentation that we could actually physically isolate them and then characterize their structures by um, NMR spectroscopy. And one more thing I would like to mention here, the main active principle here is Kojic acid, a very simple molecule. Um, normally we wouldn't really be interested, but again, in the particular context of this project, that is actually an interesting finding because that structure on the bottom right, Kojic acid, is simple enough that we could need, if we need to, synthesize it. Uh, so we wouldn't really need to rely on extracts to incorporate them into our textiles, but we actually could do it with um, either commercial or synthesized material. Right, let me switch to a different class of organism. So we also work with extremophilic actinobacteria. And I have a relatively short story because when Professor Handayani approached me originally, I said, I'm gonna talk about marine nature products. Well, most of our work with actinobacteria is actually from terrestrial habitats. So I will talk briefly about our initial studies uh, using marine 
uh, actinobacteria. So this is already a few years back. So we actually had the chance through a very important research collaboration to get access to material that has been isolated from the bottom of the ocean. Um, the actual strains came from the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest place on earth. It's almost 11 kilometers deep. And at that time, that collection was done in, uh, I think 2000 or so, the only institution who could, who had submersibles that could go that deep was the Japanese organization JAMSTEC. And their diving robot Kaiko that collected our sample, the sample that we worked with eventually, unfortunately got lost in 2003. So basically, basically the cable got ruptured. So that submersible is now lost. But fortunately, our collaborators, Alan Bull and Mike Goodfellow, two eminent scientists in the UK, experts, world experts in the taxonomy of actinobacteria, managed to obtain the sediment sample before. They quickly identified the most interesting strain as belonging to the genus Dermacoccus. Very interesting one, the name Dermacoccus implies that the original isolates were actually obtained from skin of patients, human patients, and then they managed to isolate new representatives of the same genus from the bottom of the ocean. Of course, that raises very, very interesting ecological questions, but more importantly, they then passed on the extracts to us. So the studies you see in this transparency were done even before I joined the University of Aberdeen. But we then did the chemical grow up and sure enough, we found known a new compounds, a series of phenazine type compounds called, that we called the demacosines. They are quite interesting because they um, ex exhibit um, activity against trypanosoma in particular, Chaponosoma brucei brucei, the causative agent of African sleeping sickness. And these data were established at the Drug Discovery Unit of the University of Dundee, south of Aberdeen. Um, unfortunately, that story kind of stops here. We wanted to follow up, but for some reason that we don't really understand, the strain that we had, the derm dermacoccus, kind of forgot how to make these compounds, it mutated. And so it still produces their macrocines, but at very, very low levels, which makes any further chemical work with this very, very difficult. And in the same collaboration, we also get, uh, gained access to a very fascinating habitat. That's the Chilean Atacama Desert, you can see in this picture. It's said to be the driest place on earth. And this is not just a marketing slogan. I think they, there's a scientific foundation for that. There are weather stations that have been set up in the 1920s in the Chilean Atacama Desert. And in some of these weather stations, there hasn't been a single day of rain in the last 100 years. Of course, that doesn't mean there's no um, precipitation at all. So there's a little bit of moisture coming in from the sea. The Atacama Desert is actually quite close to the east coast of uh, Chile, meaning the east coast of the South American continent. And once again, um, Alan and Mike isolated um, Streptomyces species. And here I would like to stress that it is really important if you can, as a chemist, if you can work with an eminent taxonomist, you can save yourself a lot of time. As a chemist, I would normally say, if you ask me to analyze a Streptomyces strain, I would say, nope not interested simply because they have been extremely well studied. Alan and Mike could actually point to us, look, these may be streptomyces species, but they all belong to a clade of closely related species that has never been encountered before. And sure enough, when we analyze those strains chemically, I'm not showing this today because I really would like to focus on a bit more new research data. When we analyze them chemically, we basically went from one discovery of a new compound to another. It was really a bonanza, a really treasure trove. I've never really experienced anything like that. So again, if you can collaborate, if you can set up a collaboration of a chemist and a taxonomist, it doesn't have to be a microbial taxonomist. Of course, the same would um, be true for a plant taxonomist who can help you to biologically de-replicate your samples, meaning pinpointing organisms that are, are unlikely to have been studied, then chemically, these tend out to be much, much more interesting. 
So to come to the project at hand, um, based on this original work, we established a collaboration with researchers in Chile, the group of Professor Juan Asenio, and one of his postdocs did full genome um, analysis of some of these strains, and we identified biogenetic gene clusters coding for RIPs, um, um, ribose, ribosomally synthesized and post translationally modified peptides, and in particular, um, we one subgroup of these are the so-called lasso peptides. Lasso peptides are unique in a sense that they actually have what people call the lasso structure. It's, I would probably prefer the scientific name. It's also called a lariat, which is the Latin name for a knot, which is probably closer to the mark. So basically, we have a loop. And the end of the peptide kind of sticks through this loop and forms something which resembles probably more a knot rather than a lasso. The biosynthesis of these is, is well understood now. So this unique knot structure or lariat structure is actually formed with, with the growing chain of the amino acids. So basically um, the tail of a linear precursor peptide is folded back onto itself and then individual aminos, amino acids are excised by proteases and then um, the ring basically forms in situ. So it's not like the tail would be stuck through a loop, but actually it's this unique lateral structure is formed during the biosynthesis. <clears throat> so Carlos Cortes from our Chilean partners identified a um, large biogenetic gene cluster in the genome of Streptomyces wasconensis. Our lab's code was HST28. And I'm not an expert in, in genome analysis, but um, based on the gene sequence, you can actually predict, first of all, what type of amino acids you have. And it actually allows you to come up with a educated guess what the final structure would be. And you can predict the expected molecular weight. And when we did the MS analysis in our lab in Aberdeen, that was done by Scott Jarmusch in collaboration with our Chilean friend, Carlos Cortes. We did find uh, masses that would correspond to the predicted um, size of this lasso peptide. And the lasso peptide has a tail, which is linear, and a ring, which is cyclic. The linear tail is rather easy to fragment by MS. And as you can see here, well, for a big molecule, of course, the picture gets a little bit complicated, but uh, it's still manageable. So we could easily fragment the tail. The real challenge is the ring because with the ring, it doesn't have a predefined opening point. So if you manage to break it open, it can break open at any of the amino acids present. And that means gives rise to quite a few parallel fragmentation pathways going on at the same time. Um, the nice thing is, with these compounds is that you can use MS and NMR uh, at the same time. For NMR, you go for NOE effects. So basically through space interaction. And we were lucky that the NMR uh, showed some gaps that we could actually fill by using the fragmentation pathways. So taking these two techniques together, none of them would give the unique and full picture, but combining them allowed us to fully establish the overall structure. And in this particular context, we actually also did some method development uh, through a collaboration with German researchers, Albert Sigmund from um, uh, Dortmund. Um, we were able to um, find uh, conditions uh, that allows us to sequence the cyclic part. And the technique used here was HCDMS, which stands for higher energy collisional dissociation. In this particular example that I'm showing here, we have seven amino acids. And each of these seven amino acids, um, you can have the, the ring can break open. And that means you have seven parallel fragmentation pathways. The fragmentation of peptides is well established. So you use the A, B, C, and X, Y, Z nomenclature. 
the B ions that we are interested here basically form when the chain um, fragments from the amino terminal end and, and fragments right at the peptide bond. If you look at the structure, we can actually predict that we have 30, 35 potential B ions. And indeed, in our approach, we were, made, we were able to I observe 33 of these 35 possible B ions. So a very important tool to um, study cyclic peptides. As I said, the analysis by MS is not really trivial. Um, let's skip this one in the interest of time and let me come to the last part of my presentation. And this is about microbial co-cultivation. So, I've already mentioned the example of Professor Fennecott's group who were really instrumental in basically, yeah, establishing this concept in uh, the context of marine nature products chemistry. And our first steps were actually quite humble ones. We kind of accident accidentally stumbled into this and that's a story, even though it's a few years old, I would like to briefly mention. <clears throat> So when we studied um, these Treptomyces species from the Atacama Desert, this study was done by Mustafa Ratip, at that time our PhD student, now as I said, an established researcher with his own research group in Scotland. And he did all the chemical analysis of these Treptomyces um, strains. And when he first looked at these, he would discover one set of new compounds after another. It was really, really fascinating to see that. Well, and one day he came to me and showed me the spectrum of a steroid, which we readily identified as agosterol. And that made me think a little bit because agosterol, of course, a typical fungal steroid, but had never been described from actinobacteria. Well, when we looked at the other metabolites that he found, <clears throat> we realized that all other compounds in that extract were also typical fungal compounds. And that basically led us to the conclusion that we must have a fungal contaminant in our Streptomyces strain. And sure enough, Mustafa simply went ahead, took the fermentation broth, isolated microorganisms, and beside the Streptomyces, he was indeed able to find an Aspergillus fumigatus. We have no idea where this strain comes from. We don't know whether this contamination was introduced in our lab or maybe already when we received the strains, but Mustafa then also found a set of new fungal derivatives and we decided, okay, if we want to publish this, let's use the isolated culture of the fungus. We need more material and we need to make sure that we have the right producing organisms. So let's grow up the fungus one more time so we can get more material of these compounds. And then we detected something really interesting. So the fungal strain by itself, that's the chromatogram you can see under A, now called a control, fungus by itself did not produce anything. And the other control that we did, of course, we also did the streptomyces that we had isolated as a pure strain in the meantime. And again, nothing. The HPSC chromatogram is just flat. And I said, that's interesting. So let's deliberately mix these two microorganisms one more time. And Mustafa actually spent quite a bit of time to come up with a real protocol that we still use. So the conditions uh, have been carefully optimized by him, but in a very reproducible manner. If we mix the fungus and the <clears throat> bacterium in the fermentation broth at the right amount at the right time, sure enough, we can basically reproduce the production of these fungal compounds. So very interesting finding. The fungus by itself, if you cultivate it in a pure culture, doesn't even think about producing these compounds. It has no reason to. If you produce, if you ferment it by itself, it's like paradise to it. It sees no reason to um, put any effort in chemical defense, only in the presence of the microorganism, in this case, the streptomyces, it basically reactivates its gene clusters. And we have then used this example to induce the production of secondary metabolites in quite a few other systems. Uh, one more interesting finding here, still the original story of the Aspergillus fumigatus and the Streptomyces. We did actually try to stimulate the fungus by um, giving it an extract of the Streptomyces, but that it didn't do it. 
we found out in our system, we really need the physical contact between the two micro, microbial partners. But in the course of these studies, we also incubated the fungus with a known quorum sensing molecule, Homo serenactyl. And sure enough, it reacted once more with producing compounds we hadn't seen before and which haven't been found in the Streptomyces co-culture. These are the MS genes that you see here. So these Aspergillus fumigatus that we came across is highly uh, inducible by a variety of different stimuli. Um, we have developed this further. So um, in the beginning, we mainly looked into fungal bacterial co-cultivation for the simple reason uh, it's very easy to attribute which is the actual producer of a compound simply by looking at the structure and they decide on structural features. These are either bacterial or fungal compounds. And we actually have examples, I'm not showing today, where a fungus also induces a bacterium to produce compounds. If you deal with two organisms of the same kingdom, two bacteria, it gets a bit more complicated. And we have actually used this device, so a cultivation chamber, where the two parts of the fermentation are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. So, um, and that worked for a system where we used E. coli and a gut microbe. Unfortunately, I can't really show you any chemistry because while this experiment was going on, we went into lockdown in Scotland and both Eleanor Conti and Scott Jarmusch have now left. They have completed their degrees. So I'm afraid I can't really show you any chemical outcome, but Scott was also instrumental in um, the last story I'm gonna tell uh, today. And that is the induction of the production of yet another set of lasopeptides. So in a completely different project, we were able to get our hands on yet another deep sea sample. In this case, it was a pseudomonas, a gram negative bacterium, actually a set of strains. And these were obtained from the South Shetland Trench in Antarctica. And in that project, we not only had the chance of um, sampling, but also the funding also allowed us to get full genome sequences of some selected strains. And we selected these pseudomonas strains. And using bioinformatic tools, we once again were able to identify the presence of lasopeptide gene clusters. Um, in this case, it's so-called lasopeptide class two gene cluster. And its predicted molecular formula is shown here. So the mass is 1700, so even bigger than the ones I have shown before. And as we had a series of strains, we also looked into a second one, Pseudomonas Zaudang. Zaudongensis, South Shetland Strange 2, it pretty much had the same um, gene cluster, even though it was not the same species. So, so two minutes yeah. left. Two yeah, minutes I'm, left. Yeah. I'm about to finish. Yeah. So um, Kevin and Scott were able to come up with culture conditions that allowed us to ramp up the production. Um, let me go to this transparency. So the SST3 strain produces very, very small amounts of the peptide detectable by, by MS. So that is basically this kind of purplish um, peaks. You can see very close to the baseline, but by combining the two strains in the right amount, we were actually able to induce the production by a factor of 40 or so. And this was actually instrumental. This allowed us to obtain enough material that we could uh, do the structural characterization. So here, basically two members of the same genus uh, interact with each other, um, allowing ramping up of the production. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to, to do the structural characterization of this unique metabolite. Okay, let me come to the conclusions of my talk. So I hope I was able to show that fungal and bacterial strains obtained from marine or extreme habitats, including deserts, are chemically underexplored and also microbiology underexplored, I should say. But they continue to produce chemically diverse nature products with relevant biological activities. The last part, I was talking about co cultivation. In our um, view, this is a very powerful approach to even further increase the already substantial metabolic capacity of 
chemically prolific uh, microorganisms. And all of these studies, all of these metabolomic studies greatly benefit from using automated dereplication techniques such as the GNPS tools that I've mentioned. And again, I like to say this one more time, I'm not getting paid by anyone, it's a freeware tool. So it's certainly accessible to anyone, including you from Indonesia. So with this, let me thank our um, the different scientists involved in this. Our uh, Marine Biodiscovery Center is led by Professor Marcel Jaspers, the very tall guy in the background in the top picture. I have, men, I have pretty much mentioned all other scientists already on the slides. I would like to thank my uh, our funders. And last but not least, of course, I would like to thank you for your very kind um, attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rainer Abel. Uh, it is very incredible lecture from Dr. Rainer Abel, um, very inspiring and evocative for our further research progress. And so with that, we will go ahead and set some time for question now. We will open Q&A uh, Q session within 10 minutes ahead. I will see in the chat box and Q&A column. Yes. Um, uh, excuse me, Tia. Yes. Can I uh, say ah. hello for the oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Good to see you again. <laughs> oh my God. It's nice <laughs> yeah. to see you again. <laughs> nice. So nice yeah. to see you again. So maybe my for the benefit of the audience, I'm not going to show a picture of you, but for the benefit of the audience, yeah, thank you. Thank and you. I did our yeah. PhD at the same oh. research group in, at the University of Würzburg in Germany. <laughs> and yeah, so, and I think it's the first time that we actually, or maybe the second really? time so, that we actually see each other. Oh my too. God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very, so very happy to see you. And again, thank, uh -huh. thank you so much okay. for giving me yeah, this, yeah. this opportunity to present. I have, I, I have many questions for uh, uh, for you, I, I actually. I, I do also research, same like, like you, yeah, uh, Rainer. We we have to do we uh, again the, the the research collaboration. Please Absolutely. please please please. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yes. I like I like your 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 second conclusion about the co cultivation, Rainer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> okay. You. Yeah. Okay, please continue. Okay, thank you, Prof. Dian Handayani. Yes, as we know, at the beginning of your lecture, you you said uh, you told us about Professor Dian Handayani as one of your collaborator. Yeah. in Germany, right? That's correct, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we, yeah. Were, we were lab mates. So <laughs> I did my PhD in the same research group than Professor Dion, and also my wife, Ruanjali. Actually, also... he is a promoter. He is my second uh, doctor father, you know, <laughs> Dr. Abel. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh... Before, oh yes, this is, uh, there are many questions, but uh, I have uh, one question uh, before I read this, uh, this, the list of the questions. Is there uh, anyone in your research group or collaborators could dive or swim? Ah, that's a very good question. Yes, okay, <laughs> let me uh, go back a bit further. So one of the main motivations I had, like many others in the field, was actually to do research, you have to do diving. So basically, find an excuse for somebody to pay you to go diving and calling it a research, of course, is a very, very attractive starting point. So that is what many pe people in the field did. Um, I'm not sure whether you ever have been to Scotland. But if I go back, so if you can see this really nice bird here, so it's a very cold adapted bird. If you look at the lower picture, that's a picture of our research group doing a barbecue in the summer. Just look at the clothing that we wear there. You can already guess that the temperature is not very high. So diving in Scotland, water <laughs> is very, very cold, is not really a pleasure. And that is the reason why we mainly nowadays use um, commercial um, suppliers, commercial in a sense, we don't really have to pay for them. That's the interesting bit. So you may know that Scotland has a large oil industry and we have loads of uh, research vessels and we also have loads of um, drilling platforms. 
And the maintenance ships have a lot of downtime and we have a very uh, smart scheme that during their downtime where they can't do anything at any rate, but they still have to be out on the sea for legal reasons, they actually collect samples for us and also for others. Yeah, so that is the reason why we nowadays use so many deep sea samples. The other reason is um, even in the marine habitat, nowadays, if you go to easily accessible organisms, chances are that you will not find anything new simply because it has been studied before. Yeah, but in principle, yes, I do dive a little bit but I haven't really been active for, for a long, long time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Reiner. And the, uh, these are the questions. First, as we know, the total active compound extracted from natural product is very limited. Do you have any idea how to develop them into medicine? Ah, that's a very good question. This is one of the main reasons why we increasingly focused on microorganisms. So with a microorganism, rather than a plant or a sponge or a coral, like Professor Dian was worth working with in her days in, in Germany, um, with a microorganism, you have a problem because you really can't, you can't really cultivate. Maybe plants to a certain extent, but it takes a lot of money to develop the process. With microorganisms, on the other hand, we can at least in principle ferment it at very, very large scale. So the pharmaceutical industry produces uh, penicillin cephalosporins and they use fermentation up to 50,000 liters. So that means for a microorganism, at least in theory, the knowledge is out there how to ramp up the production. Yeah, I'm not suggesting it's easy, but at least in principle it's possible. And the other thing you can do, you can simply identify the gene clusters for a compound of interest and put them into a suitable host, E. coli, for example, Pitcher pastoris or so, and then produce the compound in a different host. Heterologous expression is also another route that we can follow in principle. Yeah. So the supply issue is, is certainly is, is relevant for the pharmaceutical industry, but working with microorganisms, in principle, it can be solved. Okay. Uh, the next question is about uh, if microorganisms uh, we use this as a product and then uh, it might have a harm effect or also pharmaceutical effect. So with pharmaceutical effect, how could we differentiate that it has a main effect or side effect? Right. Um, I would say that as main, of course, mm -hmm. any nature product mm -hmm. you look into will have the desired effects and the side effects. Mm -hmm. I would assume that your question is more about other microbial products present in the fermentation. I think that is mainly a question of uh, purifying the compounds to, to, to the required level. But in principle, that is not really different from um, plant derived compounds. Also there you have normally a suite of other accompanying metabolites. And if you want to go into the clinics for clinical trials, let alone to develop a new drug, you need to make sure that your isolation process is robust and basically purifies the compound of interest to the required level of purity. Yeah, But again, I would say there's no real difference in that particular aspect, in that particular regard between microorganisms and, and plants. So these methods and the protocols are out there. Uh, I wouldn't think that this is, this is a specific, specific problem yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Reiner. And the third question, uh, thank you for interesting talk. Can we do uh, from Nova Sahni? Uh, can we do co-culture with any species of bacteria and fungi? And can we distinguish which part of the compound from co-culture are parts of bacteria or fungi metabolism? Yeah, so that is... Yeah, as I said, we have two ways of doing this. So we have done pretty much all different combination, fungus, bacterium, 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 fungus, and fungus. If you use different classes of organisms, you can look at the structures and predict who's the producer. If you use members of the same class, it's more difficult. Um, 
you can ultimately use sophisticated MS tools like the ones developed by Professor Dorostein, the um, developer of GNPS that I've mentioned, he can actually uh, use um, MALDI-based imaging. So if you know the molecular weight of a compound, you can basically detect its presence in, say, a fungal mycelium using MALDI imaging. That's one way to trace the producer. The other one is basically what, we, what I try to show with, with using these culture chambers. Of course, in this particular approach, if we physically separate the two partners, um, then we can, of course, see, um, to a certain extent, we can see where a compound um, shows up first. Of course, these, these are miscible, but you can guess where the production of a compound originates. So that would be another means of potentially identifying who is the producer. But in principle, you're right. That is, of course, a crucial question when you deal with uh, microbial co-cultivation, identifying, correctly identifying the partner responsible for producing it. And of course, nowadays in the area of genomics, if we have a microorganism of interest, of course, getting a full genome sequence is at least in principle is possible. And then you can use bioinformatic tools in the respective genomes and identify whether you can find the, respect, the respective biogenetic gene clusters. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Nova. Is it clear enough the explanation? I hope I hope so. And several time, Dr. Reiner, I, I heard several time you said you say that eminent scientists you've collaborated with. So here in Indonesia, of course, you want to be one of your eminent scientists that you <laughs> that you that you give chance to collaborate with you. So uh, is there any requirements to become eminent scientists, according to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> if you look at the picture of our research group, you can see that we actually, let me show that once, once again, if you look at the two picture of our research group, yeah. our research is very, very international. Uh, unfortunately, at the time these two pictures were taken, I don't think we had any, scientists from Indonesia. We had PhD students from Indonesia previously. Oh. Um, so in Aberdeen, of course, in Germany, the lab of Professor Prox, as Professor Dian will uh, testify, there were loads of PhD students from, from, from Indonesia. So we are definitely very, very open for, first of all, accepting PhD students from any place in the world. And collaboration is basically the same thing. We collaborate with many, many people. If you look at our publications, we normally have, I don't know, 10, 15 authors and normally from at least five, six, seven different countries. So our research, approach to research is very, very international. And certainly we don't require anyone to be an eminent scientist before we collaborate with them. Of course, if we have the chance to, to collaborate with, with um, microbial taxonomists like the ones I mentioned, of course, we will always go for it but we are certainly very, very open. Um, just one thing, if you are, if some people in, in the audience would be interested in pursuing a PhD, we are based in the UK and the UK, similar to the United States, charges quite substantial fees. So you will probably need some source of funding. That's something we as academics can't really influence is our, our universities that basically require this. So, um, but there are fellowship organizations out there that allow people also from Indonesia to come to the United Kingdom. But again, if you're interested, we certainly very, very open to this. Okay, we still have two minutes. If there is any question. Yes, I have uh, ah, yeah. one question, okay. uh, Reiner. Uh, yep. Please tell tell me about the GNPS. How how can we access uh, the the GNPS database? Is it okay? Uh -huh. I can send you a link, but if you put GNPS into Google, you will find it uh, right away. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, it has, a, it has a dedicated web page. I think it's just www.gnps.edu. Okay. But again, I can look it up and and, and send the link to you. Or mm -hmm. anyone in your group puts in, in Google, you'll find it right away. So you need to register for free. 
uh -huh. and you need to create a, an account and yeah. everything else then goes automatically. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're probably in a quite a comfortable situation in Indonesia because you're not in the same time zone as the US. So uh -huh. the GNPS servers get quite busy mm -hmm. in the regular working hours in the United States. Mm. So that's why our people normally do their GNPS searches early in the morning UK time when the Americans are asleep. Mm. <laughs> and you can yeah, do no something. Problem. Yeah, problem. you can no do problem. something. Right? <laughs> yes. But okay. so the GNPS actually has a dedicated protocol on their website telling you exactly what you need to do. You can download okay. all the required tools, the access to GNPS itself is free, and also the converters that you need to convert your MS data are also freeware. So the whole mm -hmm. GNPS community really is based on, on um, yeah, free soft access to software. So the, 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 the real prerequisite, the only thing that you really need is MS data. Um, but if you can get MS data, and it doesn't have to be high resolution, even low resolution will do. Okay. Any MS data that has fragmentation information, that can be uploaded onto GNPS. It doesn't matter which instrument manufacturer mm -hmm. you have, you need to convert your data into a unified format at any rate, but the process is really, really simple. Okay. And let me go one better. Yes. So, you know, Ruan is very, very active in this field. So I think she's certainly willing <laughs> to help, she's offering yeah. seminars and, and, and tutorials in this subject on a regular basis. Uh -huh. So if, if that is of interest for you, uh, we can certainly uh, organize something between Ruan and, and, and my okay. group. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will contact her. Pile Grusev yeah. from Aus Padang, from my, my family. For the yes, Ruan. Yeah, uh, yeah, Rainer. <laughs> yeah, well, a very, very expensive color that you find difficult to get. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Rainer. Okay, thank Tina. you so much. And best regards from Ruan as well. Of course. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. Okay, thank you, Dr. Reiner. Uh, so, um, uh, with the six in Indonesia, with six different time hour to with uh, USA and uh, with uh, UK and uh, twelve different yeah. uh, hour with US. So it is will it will be challenge a challenge for for us. Uh, and of course, we have we can uh, we can use our time to to collaborate with. Uh, people in UK and also in US. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. But again, the GNPS, you don't need to talk to anybody. That's yeah. done automatically. So that means it's actually a benefit. You can use the GNPS servers at a time where the Americans are not using it because they're sleeping. Yeah, they're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, okay. Uh, it looks like that we've covered all questions. For those who still want further explanation, you can send an email to the committee. The email address in our website, iccscp at far.unan.ac.id. Uh, Greg, thank you, Dr. Reiner. We really appreciate your time and your lecture. Give applause to Dr. Reiner, Abel. <laughs> and we will give a certificate appreciation for your lecture. Uh, for the MC, please share the certificate to the screen. I need to share the screen. Okay, thank no, you, no, Dr. The, the, okay. the, the committee. Thank you, Miyato, for guiding the plenary lecture for very well. And I would like to thank to Dr. Rayner for sharing his knowledge that very useful for all of us. Okay, now I'd like to invite Dr. Raynor again to be on the screen to take a certificate as the appreciation and thanks for your willingness to become the plenary lecture three in ICCSP 2021. Please give your best smile because our ID committee will take a screenshot for documentation. Okay, Alkan, two, three, two, one. Okay, thank you, Dr. Terima kasih. <laughs> Sama-sama. <laughs>
Terima kasih. Now, as our appreciation for our amazing moderator, Apoteker Najimiatul Fitria PhD, please let us to put you on a screen to take a certificate as the appreciation as the moderator in the session too. Please give your best smile and I'll count. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, yes. doctor. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Yes, distinguished guests and dear all participants. Now we are going to continue our conference to the last agenda, which is continue the parallel session. Now we are invite you to join again the parallel session of our, for our invited speaker and oral presentation, which as mentioned before, divided into four breakout rooms, pharmaceutical chemistry, pharmaceutical technology, pharmaceutical biology, and pharmacology clinical pharmacy. Once again, you can join each room by accessing the selected room in the registration page where you can access in the lobby before. Please read email that been sent to your register email address to follow much detailed step and please follow the step provide the guidebook. However, please reach out the community if in the WhatsApp in the WhatsApp if if have any problem regarding this conference. As mentioned, there are four different rooms based on a pharmacy specialty. Room one, room one will be will be discussed about pharmaceutical chemistry. Room two will be discussed about pharmaceutical technology. Room three will be discussed about pharmaceutical biology, and room four will be discussed about pharmacology clinical pharmacy. However, the end of the parallel session in each room will mark the end of today's conference agenda. I hope all of us had productive and inspiring time together. I hope you found the presentation on this conference are informative and, hope and helpful. As your master astronomy today, from the deepest of my heart, I'm so happy to be your master astronomy today. We hope you have enjoyed yourself on this conference so far, and inshallah, I'll be hosting this conference again for our second day of conference tomorrow with more amazing speakers. That's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention, and I do apologize for all of the mistake. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.